So I told you at the beginning of uh, this morning that uh, Sean Thompson wasn't going to be able to make it. And I know it's, a, it's hard to replace a guy like Sean Thompson, but we did. Um, we, you know. <laughs> We did, and um, thankfully, I pulled a Hail Mary with my friend, Bob McKnight. He's the co-founder and former CEO of Quicksilver, and he's been a friend and mentor of mine for many, many years, and I've really admired how he approaches everything. I mean, you know, even at the ripe age of 15, 16-ish right now, you know, he's still a grom at heart, and he drips salt water, he's authentic, um, and he's, he's still a leader in our industry, and I wanted him to come and talk about conservation from the brand side, and he's also gonna share with us a new initiative that's going on in, in his orbit. So please help me welcome Bob McKnight. Thanks, Mike. Come on up here. <laughs> Look, he brought his notebook and everything, too. Gosh, he's all prepared. Oh, my God. 24 hours, right? Less than that, I think. I think less than that. Well, thank you so much for being a good sport. Um, look, Bob, uh, you know, let, why don't we talk a little bit about Quicksilver? Give everybody the lay of the land of Quicksilver and how it started and everything, because it's a great uh, story. Um, so I grew up in Pasadena, San Marino. I was definitely landlocked, playing tennis, Little League, all the normal stuff. And I came down here when I was about six or seven years old, felt the ocean, sand between my toes, saw some guys riding longboards, and I went, wow, that's just, that's what I want to do. So I just sort of self-taught myself to surf. Um, as soon as my sister got her driver's license, she could drive us down to the beach, like, every chance we got. I just, got, I just fell in love with surfing, the whole deal. And so later on, I, um, I went to USC, um, the School of Business, and along the way, I went on the semester at sea, the World Campus Afloat thing. And for me, it was just a giant surf trip around the Pacific. <laughs> but along the way, I went to Bali, and I met a guy by the name of Jeff Hackman, very famous surfer in our world, and I actually met my future wife, too. But um, so that trip was pretty special in my life. But fell in love with Bali, came back home, Jeff and I hung out a lot, and he knew about these shorts coming out of Australia called Quicksilver, in the just total entrenched in the, in the core of surfing. These shorts were really different. They were scallop leg, wide waistband, Velcro, snap, and closure system. Very, very different. It sounds weird now, but they really were different back then. And so he convinced me to do a little business with this thing called Quicksilver. For me, I'd been making some kind of amateur hour uh, Super 8 surf films paying my way through school. So my thing was to finish school at SC, go away for a year, have a business experience, and then I'm gonna go be in the film business. That's what I wanted to do. So Jeff convinced me to, let's do this, this Quicksilver project, that'll be a project. And so everything I learned at SC, I didn't apply any of it to the thing. I never built a business plan. I never did a marketing plan. I never went through the five Ps. I, we didn't do anything. We just, my thing was to just, let's just do this short thing, sell them up and down the coast, out of the back of my car, hang out with Jeff Hackman, surf all the great spots, meet a bunch of great people, and then I'll go to film school, or go to the graduate school, excuse me. So anyway, we started Quicksilver, um, 1976. Uh, I was 21 years old, just fresh out of college, and uh, it's just been an amazing run. I mean, we started Quicksilver, and then we only did three styles of board shorts for our first, call it 15 years. Uh, we went public to raise some money at that point, a real small little offering, brought some money in, Grew to 100 million really quickly. Everybody told me that apparel is not for me. <laughs> it's a ruthless, horrible business, which it is, by the way. But um, you know, we thought, oh no, no, we're not in apparel. We make like equipment for surfers. That's our deal. Apparel, we don't want to get into that. So it was never ever meant to be. You know, at our biggest, we were a two and a half billion dollar company. Now we're somewhere around two billion with um, eight brands now. You've probably heard of a lot of them, Quicksilver, Roxy, DC, Shoe. Um, and now we've brought the Billabong brands in, so Billabong, Billabong Girl, uh, Ruka, Element, Von Zipper, uh, XL Wetsuits, they're all under our canopy now, something we call the whole master company, is called Board Riders now. So 40 years ago, when I sort of started it to today, it's uh, been an amazing ride, but that's kind of like gives you a quick little history. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Bob. I know there's a lot of details in those well, 40 years. Yeah. But, a lot of good uh, stories. Yeah. Sometime over a few beers, I can go off a little bit more. But. Done. <laughs> I will take you up on that. Look, um, let's talk about 
you know, Quicksilver was a pioneer in so many different aspects, board shorts, apparel, going public, growing the pond, all that stuff. But at what point, and you know, did, did you realize that Quicksilver had to do something in conservation, protecting the ocean? Because I know you guys did some really cool things early on yeah. that you know, other brands weren't thinking about or doing. So yeah. what were some of those things? Well, in 1991 uh, was a really critical time, in my opinion, for about beach, surf, cleanliness, all that. We had, um, I mean, surfing was taking off. It was going great. But we had, in 91, we had the first uh, Iraqi war. We had drought across America. We had a really bad recession. But the critical things for us, um, we were a $100 million company at that point. We were selling everybody. Everything was great. Not a problem in the world. But we had shark attacks in all over the East Coast, West Coast, and Hawaii. I mean, severe shark attacks that year, and all publicized and everything else. We had, um, uh, uh, they started measuring the ozone layer, which we don't have one, so people are getting skin cancer and the whole melanoma thing. So don't go in the sun ever again, everybody. And then they started measuring urban runoff. And what they discovered is that all the beaches were polluted, um, toxic pollution. Um, hepatitis, running amok, disease, people in the water. We had syringes on the beach in New Jersey, you know, people getting AIDS from stepping on syringes. And I mean, I can imagine making, we're in the beach war business, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, don't go in the sun, don't go in the water, you might get attacked by a shark. But other than that, it's all good. <laughs> and uh, also, we had a, um, a, a, a trend at that point called neon. Um, and neon was a, in, in fashion then, and neon died the same year too. So this is like a just a knock to the brain of all of us. And, um, but anyway, from that, and we'd done well, and we rekindled the deck and everything else. But at that point, I, in my mind, I thought, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a big company now. I'm a CEO and chairman of the board of a very large public company in this space. So it's time that we, you know, kind of give back a little bit and look after our own playgrounds. And our playgrounds are the beach, the ocean, the lakes, the rivers, and the mountains, because uh, we make a, we have a huge snowboard um, uh, group also. So we formed the Quicksilver Foundation somewhere back in the, the 91 to 95 period. I can't remember right now, but we started um, and we were the first company in the, our space to really do that. I mean, Patagonia was off doing their sustainability thing, which is kind of a tangent of the same sort of theory about looking after the planet. Um, there was some other uh, companies doing little projects here and there, but we we formalized it, formed the foundation, and we started um, enacting our vision of what we wanted to do. And it's, it's, it's been, always been grounded in water cleanliness, ocean, ocean clean, ocean projects, um, and then uh, kids, science, uh, education, wellness, when it has to do with things kind of related to the ocean, which are many. Um, and we just followed that path of, uh, with some of our projects are global, some of them are local, and we, we are also a global company, so we have offices in, in Australia, um, near Melbourne, a place called Torquay, and in the south of France, in Biarritz. So all three of our regions also started enacting their own um, initiatives within our uh, Master Quicksilver Foundation. So it's, and we ran it for, I don't know, we had it all the way up until about three, four years ago. Uh, we, had to, we had to sort of put it in hibernation because the company had some financial problems. And now we've relaunched, but now we call it Board Riders Foundation because it involves all the brands. And that was about, uh, in fact, this last year we've, we've relaunched Board Riders Foundation, so. Yeah, so look, that's good. Now, you know, one of the things that you guys did early on that caught my attention, and I can't remember exactly when it started, but you guys had a really cool program with the Indies Trader, <laughs> okay? And yeah. I'm sure that was a bit of a headache for you as well. You know, with some of the logistics and everything. But I mean, what a cool project. Tell us about the Indies Trader. And I think the Indies Trader also opened up an opportunity with Reef Check yes. as well. Can you talk about the Indies Trader and how that led to Reef Check? <laughs> yeah, well, a zone that we go a lot to is Indonesia for surfing. I think it's probably the best surfing zone in the world. And we started in Bali years ago, then we moved to Java. And now we're in Sumatra and all the islands off of Sumatra, called the Mentawai Islands. And so we, I'd been on 10 trips on this boat called the Indy Trader. The captain's kind of a pirate at large. <laughs> he really is. But um, 
classic guy. So we're, I mean, it all started, we're lying on the deck of the Indy Trader one night after a whole bunch of rum, a great surf day. Had a, got over a bliss attack from the surf and now we're having rum and we're just looking at the stars and Martin, myself and Bruce Raymond, the other guy, were just going, hey, you know, like, how, we should just do this year round. And we kind of went, wow, okay. So it sparked the idea of, from a surf trip, to take the Indy Trader and basically go around the world. Um, and this thing chugs along at like five miles an hour. It's not a fast boat, it's a big, ugly thing, <laughs> a steel boat. And so when then we decided, okay, if we're gonna do a, a, basically an extended surf trip, let's try to involve something with looking after the water or, or let's find something where we can give back while we're doing this surf trip around the world. And that's what we did. So we connected with Reef Check, which is a United Nations sponsored program. And it's really, it's amazing what they do because they, they harness the power of, um, of just uh, of boats, sailboats, power boats, uh, but not, not scientific boats, just pe recreational boats all around the world. And you sign up and then those boats go and they, they report back on what they see wherever they are. If they're in the Caribbean, if they're in Indonesia, if they're in the Philippines, if they're in Europe, off the Mediterranean, they're reporting on the, the bottom clarity, bleaching, changes of reef patterns, um, fish populations, all these things. And then all that kind of, not real scientific, but sort of loose research goes back and then Reef Check compiles it and they make a report about health of the, health of the reefs and the, the beaches and all that. And so a lot of times we, on, these, on the boat ride, we'd surf all day and then in the afternoon we'd go down with the tanks on and do measurements and there's these charts that we'd fill out and, and do take pictures and it was really fun. So it made it fun to be on this trip and the downtime you go do something that we thought was really worthwhile um, reporting back on the health of the reefs. And we'd been to some of these spots so many times we could actually from year to year see the depletion of fish or the bleaching of reefs and then in recent years, we've seen a lot of them come back, and then over these ones over there have gone haywire. So it's really interesting, just in the time we've been we've been doing that, that the how the reefs have changed and all that. But that was what Reef Check was all about. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it, I knew there was a good story behind there because that's how I got introduced by Reef Check, and I started to realize that wow, you know, um, everything that's going on in our oceans is affecting reefs yeah. as well. Any any insights come out of that um, that research that you guys did? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the main takeaway for us was that um, we always had a scientist on board the boat, too. It wasn't just all of us, you know, dangling around with the stuff. We had scientists. They usually brought up a couple other people with them, too, um, who were in botany or something to do with, you know, fish health or whatever. It was really interesting people. So at night, it wasn't just surf chat around the table. We'd talk about all these scientific things. And most of our surfers, believe it or not, are really interested in that because they also care just like we do about the health and future of the, the waves, the beaches, the rivers that feed the beaches, all this sort of stuff. So, um, but, um, so when we, when we would do all these calculations and things and, and send it back um, with all the photographs and everything else, it was a, the, the thing that, that was great is that everywhere we go on the boat was definitely next to great surf spots where there's a reef and there's a culture there, people. And these people, I mean, it's their whole life living on the fish and the healthiness of their in local habitat. And so we would go into the villages and we'd talk to them about it, like, how, how's your fish population? What, what's declining? What's growing? And, and you, you just hear these unbelievable stories about how the, in their family um, history, how their, their parents and their grandparents and all that used to, you know, go out and dive on these reefs and just, it was just, amazing populations of every kind of fish imaginable. Now it's like they have to go way out and over there and there's just this one type of fish, you know, wah wahoo or whatever, and that's all they can catch now. And, and then the reefs themselves are, you know, all the stuff that they used to, it was just amazing and the heartfelt things. And we really felt at the time, like, I mean, this is a, a really horrible situation that, you know, we, we have to fix. And that's why we, in our foundation, we focus so much on the kids, because I really believe that's where it's all about, is educating kids who then can t either tell their parents, or maybe they don't really care, but they can start working on uh, the plastics and the consumption and the, you know, the urban runoff and whatever, whatever they can do. If they, they learn that they've got a real problem, 
because I'll, I'll get through it. I'm old enough now to where, you know, whatever, but they're, 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 my kids and their kids and all that are, I mean, it's, if we don't get a hold of it, it's going to be very, very tough. How, how did that work with Reef Check and Indie Trader and all these other things that you were finding out? How did that weave into the brand story and with athletes and everything and even product? Did, did you right. know, because you guys have so many things going on. Yeah, well, I mean, we always, try to, we always try to find a little bit of a commercial value to whatever we're doing and not, not trying to exploit being a capitalist or whatever, but, but trying to connect our good work with the brands. That's really an important component of what we do in the foundation. So in the case of any trader, um, we painted it with this uh, bright red and purple uh, sort of tattoo, uh, war, war looking art. And our artist said that the whole boat was this giant painting. So everywhere it went, and it went around the world four times <laughs> for the, over five years. And um, and every place, and soon, soon they got to recognize the boat, and the township would come out, and the mayor, and they'd, you know, they all come out to the boat, and we'd host them and talk about what we're doing, all the good work. And for us, we just felt it was a good halo off to Quicksilver in the products because with, with the sailing of the boat all around the world, tons of media, all of our surfers who were quite well known would talk about it in media. And the narrative would become different than just talking about what great waves they got. It was about the grid work they did and the halo into Quicksilver, how we're really concerned and we want to help the best we can and all that kind of stuff. You know, um, I remember uh, seeing stories and photos of the Indies Trader when I had my surf shop. And it was one of those things where it was the dream of, you know, it's like, I want to go surf Tavarua. I want to go to all these exotic places. But one thing on the bucket list was, I hope I get the chance to go on the Indies Trader. <laughs> that was one thing that I heard from everybody. And I was so fortunate that um, it pulled into Newport years ago and I got invited to come and check it out and everything and it was it was amazing to see it um, but but as I looked through it I thought it was going to be some sort of luxurious experience <laughs> and I was like blown away it's like this does not look fun I mean I think it you know it, it, it's like the outside is one thing but the inside no, it's, quarters it's, it's one step up from the Contiki yeah yeah <laughs> I mean, it was it was very Spartan and uh, in that part we you know we don't mind, so it was, it was great. Yeah, well, you guys masked it pretty good because, yeah. I mean, the perception out there was like, this is luxurious, you know, surfing at its best. And you pull up, I mean, it's like a, a floating hunk of steel <laughs> and the, 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 you know, cruise quarters and the sleeping quarters are small. I mean, it's like yeah. a tin can or sardine can. Yeah, no, but we, when we came into Newport, I mean, sorry, uh, New York Harbor, we got the full rain parade from the, you know, the water you know, the, uh, the firemen and all that stuff. We you know, came here, we went to the Park of the Ocean Institute for a few weeks at a full course that they enacted down there. So it really had a great application and, um, and just, but the physical look of it was so um, iconic that wherever it went, people knew that it was attached to some sort of, you know, good deeds with the ocean kind of a message. And oh, by the way, you're probably gonna see Kelly Slater, or you're gonna see Tom Carroll, or, you know, or Lisa Anderson, or whatever, because we always put our, we put guys on, we do the Roxy girls would go on, we'd bring our sort of old timer surfers, the big wave guys from years ago, we put kids on there. So we really, we really used it well. And those guys used it into the big crossings when it went like across the Atlantic, but the second the boat got there, they'd all fly in and then get on it, and they'd do the local stuff. So, I mean, it was a wonderful project for many years. Yeah, no, absolutely, and, and it was pre-social media too. I mean, imagine yeah, well. if it was going on now with all the social media yeah. action and everything. So much great stories came out of it. Um, look, any, anything else going on? I know you're not involved on the day-to-day -day stuff at, at the brands and everything, but anything exciting going on at Quicksilver or Board Riders outside of the foundation? We'll get to that in a second, but anything else going on? Well, I think sort of every day there's something great going on. <laughs> we have great product. Um, but some of the things we've been work, working on is in our innovation area um, because uh, we, you know, we always try to innovate and be ahead of the curve and all that. So I'll tell you about two things. One is um, we have a, a project called Reprieve. And um, Mike Hughes, our national sales manager right there, just told me that we've now, we're up to 112, uh, 112 million bottles that we've crushed, putting into our boards, making our board shorts and our snowwear 
all the nylons that we make in the company, we're trying to get 100% built out of recycled uh, plastic bottles. So it's a terrific program, and uh, I think we have about 80% of our board shirts now, something like that, and about maybe 80 or 90% of our snow, snow wear in Quicksilver, and we're quickly moving with the Roxy Group into that and, and other areas of the company. DC also makes snow wear, so, but this reprieve thing has been terrific for us, and a real nice message that we're looking after some of the mess with the recycled plastic models. That's one thing. We also, um, we, you know, there's a, a big, uh, kind of a push in our world about big waves. And we've always been part of the big wave theater doing the Quicksilver Eddie I. Cal contest at YMA Bay. We were probably the first company to really get into promoting, getting behind big wave surfing, paddle in surfing, toe in surfing, but you know, giant, like 100 foot wave kind of stuff. And uh, that's why we ran the contest in YMA for many years. We also, we were the ones that started the whole Mavericks thing up there and Toto Santos and Port Escondido, now Nazare, but the big wave thing is huge. So, and there's, but there's a, we felt um, kind of like predisposed that there's also a, a real element of safety there. I mean, these guys are riding these waves, they get pounded. Thank God there's jet skis now, but there wasn't back then. And uh, these guys, you know, there, there could be death in the air. And, and uh, so we feel we have an obligation to protect these surfers. So we work with Aqualung, um, a big, uh, Jacques Cousteau, I think, founded Aqualon many years ago, but it's a San Diego-based company where they do these things. So we partnered with them in a collaboration. We built this new, like, airlift vest, we call it. And what it is, uh, it's a neoprene vest. Surfers put it on, and it has four canisters in it and these tabs. So what happens is these guys ride in the wave. All of a sudden, something goes wrong. They get smashed, and they go down, and... I'll tell you about what they do, but the, the airlift vest works where they can just pull these tabs and the thing just ignites this air inside the, the vest. So, I mean, you can be knocked out, whatever, and the vest will pull you up to the top of the surface and then hopefully you either get washed in with the surf because now you're, you're floatsome or a jet ski comes and picks you up, whatever. But it's really interesting because it's sort of um, developed more than we thought because the airlift vest gives these guys a lot more courage and protection and safety. So they now, when they get smashed, you know, my instincts would be to get to the surface as fast as you can to get a breath of air before the next one hits you, right? These guys, they go down. They don't pull the vest, they hit, get hit by a wave, they go straight down and they just sit there and they watch because they know if they're underneath the surge of the water, you know, they can hold their breath for at least a minute. Most of them more like five minutes, but let's just say it's a minute when they're all, you know, getting beat up. But there's, you know, 20-second intervals. So they can watch a wave go by, watch another wave go by, and then between that wave, they'll blast the air. They come up because they know the jet ski guy will be right there to pick them up. So it goes against every bit of my, <laughs> my nature in surfing to go down when the wave hits you. But that's what they do now. So it's amazing how this whole thing has evolved and, and all that. But our airlift, our, the, our vests are red. There's a few other companies that make them now, but if you go look at like the Maverick or the, the contest like at um, Nazare or, or Piha, you know, Jaws, there's 90% of the guys out there have red vests on now. So it's great that they're all wearing them. They're all being protected. It gives me you know, sort of like a little bit of, um, I don't know, I feel good about that, that we've probably saved a whole bunch of lives, which is great. Yeah. Well, there's just two little things that are exciting, yeah. aside no. from all the rest of the stuff we make. Yeah, no, really exciting stuff. I mean, you know, human safety is, is important, and, you know, you've got athletes who are pushing the envelope on mm. all of these things, and you're right. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm just an average surfer, but it's like if, if I'm surfing on a five-foot day, I'm thinking about getting up, you know, and these guys are yeah. surfing 20, 30, 40-foot waves. It's unbelievable what they're yeah. riding. Yeah, now. it's incredible. Oh. And I got to see the eddy back in 2009 when it happened. Uh, yeah. And that was really fun being on the beach there. You know, let's 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 go back just a, a, a moment when you talked about Reprieve and the products and everything like that. How is that being met with retailers and consumers? Any any reaction there? Well, we've we've taken a position where um, I mean, Patagonia in our world and Nivon's a very good friend of mine, but they they definitely own that sustainability space. It's been their message, you know, one percent, all these things for their whole. So we don't we don't want to take that position where, oh yeah, we'll jump into that world too. Hey, look what we do. We don't stand in a soapbox and brag about it. Um, because honestly, all of us are guilty of making stuff that's not sustainable. We all make nylons, which are the worst. 
and Patagonia makes them too. And especially when you start putting the bright red, the bright orange, the bright green colors in them, that's where it really gets bad. And we all make denim, which is probably the worst thing ever for the environment um, with the way they finish denim and, and the rivers turn, you know, like blue and brown in China every afternoon when they wash the denim. It's crazy. And we all make surfboards and we make wetsuits and we make all these things that are not good for the planet. So, you know, if I stand in a soapbox and go, hey, look at what we've done. Isn't this great? People are going to go, well, yeah, what about the this and that? And then we go, okay, I'm guilty. So what we do is we just quietly are trying to do the best we can with um, making all of our products as sustainable as they can be. And that goes with the fabrics. It goes with the washing and treating. It goes with the, how we sew, how we package, um, the hang tags, all that stuff. Every single bit of every garment or every wetsuit we make um, has all this stuff that we try to just eliminate, eliminate, eliminate to make it more sustainable. And um, one of the things that the surf industry is working on right now is all garments are shipped in plastic bags. And the plastic bags are only used because people don't want to get the, their clothing delivered to like a Macy's and pull it out of the boxes and have the product stuck together or the inks die, you know, running off. Or, so you have to put them in these plastic bags. It's just awful, but you do. And so all those plastic bags just get basically pulled out before the, and just get thrown right in the trash, right in the thing. So we're working on a you know, couple of solutions about having um, completely 100% recyclable these plastics made out of something else. Um, and so it's a big mission that one of our one of the guys that runs Billabong, uh, Shannon North, is working on. But um, so we in, the, in this whole reprieve thing, we just started because somebody came to us and presented this this uh, crushed bottle system. We got into it, and I think we've been into it for six or seven years now. So we just quietly have built up this momentum where we have, so we're one of the biggest um, secondary users of uh, bottles, plastic bottles. And, and, and Billabong also has been on the same thing on their own. But now you put us together, and we're, the number is much bigger than 112 million. I just don't know what it is. But it's an amazing number, and we put it sometimes um, next to our board shorts and our little thing, so at least we get a little bit of credit, whatever. But we don't go around and pound the thing. We just do it because we think it's right. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that go into buying, selling, manufacturing product and everything, and it's these incremental changes that need to take place. You can't just snap a finger and everything's yeah. perfect. Um, you know, and I, and I appreciate you talking about you, how you're looking at every aspect of the product from, you know, yeah. it's manufacturing to the, pro, uh, to the material and the hang tags and everything. Yeah. And so we, we donate to things like Reef Check and Surfrider Foundation. We do like the normal stuff. But also, you know, part of, I, I feel like my thing is to, you know, I need to go to conferences like this. I, I served on the board of the Wrigley Institute for many, many years. I'm on the board of still the Ocean Institute, um, which I've been on since kind of the beginning. So I feel it's, it's an obligation to me to also be there, participate, give my time, learn about all these things, try to give my, my thoughts about it and help it along and, and maybe invest in some of these things. So, so I think it's not only a company obligation to write checks to sort of foundations to feel like you've done your deal. Um, that's part of it, but I think the other part is actually to get involved and that's what we've done with the foundation um, a lot. I feel good about it. Well, that's a really good segue. You know, writing checks is is always a good thing. You know, um, and there's no shortage of issues. And let's talk about the Board Writers Foundation because now you have an army of brands yep. at, at your disposal. So let's talk about Board Writers Foundation and where where it's headed. I know it's still early days. Yep. And things are still being worked out, but it's in motion. Right. So about a year ago, I came to the, um, the new, we have uh, new owners of Quicksilver called Oak Tree, and I convinced the managing director that it was really important that we reboot the foundation. He totally agreed. So first you got to do all the technical stuff with the, you know, the state and the feds and reapply and do all that stuff. And so once we did that, we held our first um, uh, event to raise money. Because our, our thing was we want to raise money, and then we'll go out and grant it out and grants to the various things that we want to align ourselves with. And we used to have 95 things on the list. Now we want to have more like 10 things on the list. And um, in fact, Ryan Ashton's back there. He used to run our foundation, but so he knows all that. My sister started it with me and then um, ran, Ryan ran it for many years. 
But um, so we just did our first fundraiser in October. We, it was a, we called it the Fete de Bayonne in memory of Pierre Agnès. Uh, Pierre Agnès was our CEO who um, died in a horrible um, uh, boating accident last January. Uh, you probably read about it. It was national news. He, in, he was in Hasegor and his, went out on a fishing boat early in the morning. And anyway, one click off the jetty, something really bad happened, and they have still never found the body. So. We dedicated this first event to him. Um, we had at the ranch, it was a golf, real fun sort of golf format thing and a, and a dinner with speaker, with great guest speakers and uh, raised a bunch of money. And so now we're ready to start granting it out. So we've made some grants already. One is to the Aquarium of the Pacific because we had a project with them, program all along. Um, but we're looking at stuff that we've done before and then looking at new stuff because we want to, um, and, and you've been a great counsel on this, because we want to we, we wanna do things that have a more personal, curated touch. We don't want to necessarily just throw our money into, and I'm not going to pick on Surfrider, but I will, but throw it in a Surfrider Foundation and all of a sudden just goes in their general fund and pays for their, their stuff and never really gets any action going. So not that I don't like Surfrider, but we're trying to find stuff that is more small, more curated, more we can touch it, feel it, whatever, because we're also encouraging our domestic uh, people in Australia who are very active in the foundation and people in Europe to also be looking at maybe a few global things that we can identify, but mostly do things that are relevant in your zone. And there's many, obviously. So we're looking at um, stuff again in ocean health, cleanliness, um, clean water, um, there's also a whole element in wellness that we thoroughly believe in, like the cystic fibrosis um, campaign, because um, when you take kids with um, Down syndrome, um, uh, some sort of problem like that, um, autism, whatever, they get in the water, and it's like a total healing thing for them, and, and we love that. It feels like I'm connecting my world with their world. And to see a, a mother or father watch their child smile for the first time in months, getting a you know, 10 minute little boogie board ride or whatever, it's amazing. So we do a lot of that. Um, clean water, uh, kids science, that's why we're with the aquarium, they have a prop program now where um, kids, when they come in, there's a K to 12 prop program in the aquarium that is identified with the brand Quicksilver. So we're trying to do things that are more small, curated, local, we can touch them, we can see them, we can see the benefits. Um, and then we can also put some sort of halo you know, to, on the brands, whether it's Quicksilver, Roxy, Billabong, whatever. And, um, and then um, just continue the circle of, of, of projects, brand halo, things that we can see. We don't want to put monies into general you know, funds for staff and all that stuff. We want to have projects with our name on it that we own, things like that. All right, cool. Look, we're just about ready for lunch, but where can people find out more about the foundation? Because I, you know, Chris, Sean, I don't know if you guys paid Bob for that plug or anything, but, right, you know, it, it's like we just had a panel this morning that talked about surf therapy and the impact oh, that it yeah, has on yeah, families yeah. and kids. So yep. you're preaching to the choir here on all these different things. And I think that's a welcome conversation that he's talking about. Where can people learn more about the Border Riders Foundation and the process? Uh, well, we don't have quite of our website up yet, but there, we have a contact number, Border uh, you know, I have to get it to you. <laughs> I'll get it to you guys. We'll make sure we post it yeah. and everything so you guys can get the information. Yep. Okay. We have some great events coming up too, so it's kind of fun. Perfect. Cool. Well, look, um, let's, 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 let's go grab lunch. Uh, Bob's going to stick around for a little bit if you want to talk to him. Um, you know, we've had another amazing morning. We've got a couple more talks coming up this afternoon that I know you guys are going to love, so please stick around. You want to see if there's any questions? Yeah. Well, you guys want to answer any questions? You guys want to ask any questions? Oh, right here. Um, Kellen Lovell, uh, I'm with the Women's Sea Surf Club. And, uh, just nice. We've been, uh, I've stepped off the board this last year, but we've been trying to try and um, help. Yeah, I think in your case, because you know, we know John really well. <laughs> uh, by the way, a lot of these things, too, are, are friends that have started, like John um, with Waves for Waters. Um, so we like those kind of things. So just I think just contact us. Come on up. Sit down and meet. Talk about what we can do. Um, Where do we get the contacts? <laughs> I can give you my email address. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Should I, you want to do that next show? Should I talk to you? No, that's fine. I'm bob.mcknight at quicksort.com. Very easy. It's been the same yeah. email address forever. <laughs> Have at it. This, I this, can always say no, right? What was it? It was Bob.
bob.mcknight at quicksilver.com. See, this but, is the yeah, type just, of just donors that you want, right? <laughs> my, by the way, I just sent it to my daughter, Roxy, who kind of ran our foundation now. So she'll just, uh, she'll put it, if you get a hold of you and get set up a meeting. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. No, so an example of a global project would be like um, Reef Check or Movember or, you know, things that have, are kind of activated all around the world. And the more local things are the uh, MyOcean and the Wrigley Institute and things like that. Yeah. And Vipe feeds those things to me every day, the little small projects, and they're so fascinating. And I love the fish thing that I just saw up there. That was amazing. But, yeah, th I mean, things like that we love. It's just, you know, so many of them. We're just trying to, trying to do what we can, but we can't do everything, obviously. But. Yeah, Bob is uh, probably going to, like, write me off on his emails at some point because I'm always sending him ideas to him <laughs> and just like, Bob, look at this, look at this. Oh, and, my God. You know, you know, but look, Bob's heart is in the right place. Um, so is the foundation and the brands. They want to do the right thing. And I, I want to see them get involved with programs that they can impact in a positive way. So this is exciting for our industry, um, for the brands and everything too. So let's take one more question. Yeah, Allison. <laughs> Aloha. Um, I have a question. Fight on, by the way. I actually went to USC Film School, so if you need my oh, nice. advisement since you didn't get to go back. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, my question is, so as a surfer and a filmmaker, um, you know, you always grew up in Hawaii, and so I'm going to be a pro surfer, and then I'm like, no, I'm going to be a filmmaker. But I think it's interesting the shift, and I'm wondering if you see this, in like marketing from pro surfer, pro surfer, pro surfer, to like, Story-based marketing and soul surfing, and do you feel like there's been a shift, and it's going way more in the direction of? Yeah. Story, soul, we, yes. Pro, pro, pro. No, we do. We struggle with that all the time. We debate. We argue. We whatever. But so our the former CEO, that the one that passed away, he was really you know pro surfing W WSSL all that stuff. And so we have, a, we have a huge team and good team at every level and all that. But we've definitely seen the shift go to what we call sort of the alt surfing, you know, Noah Dean, all that kind of stuff. We had Dane Reynolds. I mean, that whole Michael February, there's all kinds of people we've had in that zone, and we thoroughly believe that. So that's growing for sure. There's also, um, I don't know, like ride every sort of vehicle, whatever. Um, kite sailing, um, the foil thing is happening. The, Robbie Nash is now on a windsurfing board on a foil. I mean, all these alternative things. The whole uh, surfing behind the boat in the lakes and rivers of America is a huge thing. So we're, we're, we're trying to be open to all that stuff. But we definitely have a big focus in the competitive um, thing. Uh, we think that's important to the whole world champion race and all that and the contests that, are, that get um, on the websites and, and uh, now you know, on television. So there's a big... Uh, media advantage to being involved in that, but we also love all that other stuff too. So we're trying to be. And women surfing is a huge thing we do through yeah, Roxy cause and cause-based. Cause what do you mean? Like storytelling. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we <laughs> we were trying to. I mean, that's the whole the whole thing of our whole world is storytelling because um, <laughs> you, you, these these first of all the athletes are really entertaining themselves. I mean, they they all have a story and they're great people and they have great stories. So. There's that, and then the storytelling about connecting it to things we're doing, and Jamie Mitchell's on a whole mission now having to do with aquaculture, so it's fun to connect with him. Tom Carroll's on another thing um, with shark attack prevention kind of thing. So our surfers also get involved in their own things, and, and they usually have photographers, they have Instagram, Facebook, all these things that can promote them. So on their own bat, having athletes, they're like our influencers or ambassadors, whatever, they have their own things that we support. Keep abreast, and Roxy is one that comes to mind with the Lisa Anderson deal. So, um, yeah, I think I think the having them and having them tell their stories, and we back them up with our stories, and a lot of that goes on. Has to. Cool. And you know, look, Allison is going to be closing out our uh, afternoon here. She's an amazing storyteller, adventurer. She's the you know, I think somebody's called her the female Indiana Jones, but I think that <laughs> nice. that doesn't credit her for what she really is as an amazing storyteller in, in her own special way. So make sure you guys stick around for that. 
Um, but look, let's break for lunch. I know you guys are hungry, because I know I am. Uh, let's keep the conversation going. You guys are good at that, so we'll be back in about an hour, so stick around, grab some food, talk amongst each other. Bob, thank you so much. You rock.